Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm Frozen 10's 10 years old this year. Yeah. I have done videos in time for anniversary before. This stands out even more for not feeling like it should be that long ago. Anyway, this movie is, it's complicated and it has always been. I originally didn't like it and I still kind of don't, but I also do like certain personal ideas for this story. The movie's quality also seems to work with being in the Disney of Alpha era, surrounded by so many great movies. It is one of the best bottom spots of the year, that has many other revival trims, but also highlights their weaknesses with a plot that is jumbled at points. Its popularity also didn't help much with this movie being young but also very hated. I don't really know how to feel about this as a whole, but I think I know why I can decide, so that's why I'll discuss in this review and analysis video. A 10 year anniversary for one of the best times to do this video. Part 1 The Story I will save some discussion of the character size in later parts. But I want to introduce by saying I like this story of two royal sisters, one with ice powers, where one pushes people away and the other is too optimistic and trusting. This movie has a great first act that often tricks me into thinking this will better than I remembered before going downhill after. It introduces the story and character as well with Elsa's coronation. The atmosphere is well created by its opening and the drama is well set up. However, even more than the other animated movies that do this, this didn't really have much of a plan for a middle. It involves Anna on search for Elsa and connects a few more characters on the way. After wondering about the snow for a while, Anna visits and gets a frozen heart. Then they go to the rock falls and enter the climax. This they are just wandering around the world. It is a well animated world and it's good animation in general, but it's still just a boring way to spend the all time in the middle with just the icy wasteland. Anna and Elsa barely get any time together and it feels like this is made to split up scenes. Considering this is meant to be a crucial part of the story as shown in the third act, this should have been better set up. There also should have been more from the vein and the concept of a frozen heart. This world was kind of interesting with the concept of these powers. However, it also feels that like some parts could be more explained. How did Anna having her memories erased do anything? And what did I find now cause her brain to be frozen again? This movie's story starts out great, but can't keep that same momentum, and that may be because Elsa isn't really active after yet ago. She doesn't really do that much after that point, more characters coming to her. This story isn't the most planned out as a whole, in my opinion. But how are the characters? In 2010's Disney films, it's more the characters that made it in the story. Part 2, Anna and Elsa. I really like the potential of this idea. Having a sibling relationship in the core of a story sounds great and gives Disney two character remarkability. Even though it's clear which one Disney ended up preferring. I think the opposite, but I don't dislike Elsa. I like the set of their dynamic, where they were friends as kids but tragically got separated for years. And yet how the parents were written to be understandable in a hard position, but still yet to allow trauma between both of them. Elsa became self-conscious or once easy to use in safe powers and Anna got neglected. It doesn't state that happened as much as the movie should have, but it's implied by the fact she had no one to interact with was stuck in the castle on her own for all those years. I sure hope there wasn't a sequel that tried to own all their parents' faults. This passed yet to both characters having the opposite fear, with Elsa being too shut off. And Anna being too optimistic and trusting. Both were set up to have understandable reasons for this, and the introduction to this is quite great. Anna is a really good protagonist, too proactive in the story and like her all. She has lots of princess tropes, but feels to stay down as just a bare version of Rapunzel from Tangled. Her character is enjoyable to watch with a great arc. Her serious moments work equally as well, like her determination to reason with Elsa. She works really well. The move wants to do a joint protagonist with her and Elsa both being main characters. If anything, the other marketing may seem like Elsa is more a main character. However, the story mainly follows Anna and gives Elsa's arcs yet not as good. It could have been great. I don't have a problem with Elsa acting irrational at points because her backstory is known and it makes sense to act this way because of how her parents treated her. Her want for more freedom makes sense. However, her story is supposed to be about her to open up to others more. Adding a scene of her yoni in the ice castle would have fixed this. But there isn't time because after yet a girl, Anna visits then Hans arrives shortly after. There's nothing to show even isolating a castle is a bad thing for her. Her character feels kind of contradictory by how empowering her evening is made to be. I don't want to repeat too much about Yet to Go video, but it being so empowering goes against what the movie wants. It's relatively well known at this point that Elsa was originally a villain. The movie being changed this drastically could have been more obvious. But part of this movie changing is shown by not giving Elsa enough scenes, as well as that there should have been more to the dynamic. Conceptually, I really like how Yuff breaking his spell was for sipping Yob. However, for almost an hour of the movie, they only had one scene interacting. It is just Anna trying to get Elsa to come back with her, and Elsa just telling her to leave. 
this is how y'all the conversations go. We all the interactions just feel the same. We always end up having the same conversation, don't we? <sighs> in my trolls video, I brought up that Anna knows to handle the character arcs better, which is true because in Frozen, both characters fuels our dress. However, Poppy and Branch are a fun dynamic. We spend a long time interacting and their opposing personalities pay off each other. Wait, why am I using this movie as a positive example? Frozen could have done similar, but the story set based them to Anna on the quest but else just being used by the story. This sibling dynamic could have been so interesting. Both characters are good individually, but this isn't developed like it should be. They don't have any conflict. Aside from once he knows cut, but more on that later. Now that I've got this point out of the way, how are the movie's other characters? Part 3, the other characters are also there. First off, I will not accept any Olaf Sander. He is funny and just very wholesome. His childlike view is both at the same time, moves and fit the coming for Eve. He is also important to show a part of Elsa she doesn't show, but still created Olaf. The fact that Olaf was willing to melt to save Anna, some people are worth melting for. Why wasn't this the iconic quote and not yet to go? Olaf is just great. Kristoff is also good. Sure the romance between Anna feels forced, and he is in plot important. His inclusion is more just for another character for Anna to speak to, but they have fun interactions. I just find Kristoff quite likeable. I also appreciate Sven for being a very expressive and fun non-talking animal psychic. While I don't like the movie's middle, the thought and the journey are fun and I enjoy watching them. These characters seem fine, but there's also the villains. The Duke of Weaselton is just a far worse area version of Jack Horner. He in the movie just isn't funny and he serves no threat to the first half villain. There's also Hans, who's maybe not the worst Disney twist villain, but is still flawed in presentation. Thematically it works for showing Anna being too trusting and it would be interesting to have a villain who manipulates, including to the audience as well. However, he very feels their character and more material. At least Big Hero 6 and Utopia have villains whose motivation made sense to have revenge or switch a narrative. I think Hans wants the throne, he could have easily got it by saving and marrying Anna, but he wants it to own. This leads question to what he wanted the throne for. He mentioned I have many brothers, so does he want attention as his own thing, or is it worse where he would be a dictator taking over Yann and getting revenge? It just feels like not much of his one sort of plan is revealed. He saves Elsa from being shot, but it's unclear whether he should have or not because his twist isn't well thought of. Even with this, they gave him an evil monarch that is so on the nose. Hans just becomes a generic villain who monologues and wasn't planning on Anna Yiving. There's theories I heard about the Rock Troll's mind controlling him and Hans being a mirror to reflect other people's emotions, that I do like. But the fact you need theories to make sense to this character is a problem. The other characters can be hit or miss. Now to discuss the category I want to talk about more. Part 4, The Mix Soundtrack. This movie has quite a lot of songs, especially in the first act. This was a full on musical which is a period to non-musicals. There's many Kev motifs between songs and I get to show us these characters emotions in more detail. However, some songs feel pumped out of a larger amount and there's a couple I don't like. It has more missing other Disney musicals. I consider ranking the songs but I think it's best to discuss them in order. First, Frozen has a great opening song to establish a tone and it also sounds good. This song's underrated. Do you want to be a snowman isn't? Got overpaid, but to react listening to another song in the movie. I see why the song is repetitive because it's meant to show how Anna felt through the years, but it isn't sung or written well. I really don't care for these lyrics. The music is fine, but it's not a good song. For the first time that ever happens almost immediately after, and it's a good song to show Anna's wants. It's a good example of that I want on that sounds nice and I really like the final contrast between both characters singing. It's an intense musical moment to foreshadow the conflict between them. The other's open door is really fun. I don't know if I'll still call it the best song in the movie, it's probably yours for the first time forever, but I still like it. The music has been mostly good so far, but just like the movie goes downhill, we got yet to go, which we already talked about previously. It's annoying how one part of the song is really great, but it's held back by the bad chorus repeated three times. The twisty I want song in a way just doesn't make it effective. It felt Taylor hey, made be successful, not an accident take some more film songs. Olaf gets a song and despite me liking him, Summit is not good. He does too much sing talking and feels like it's a way to yap like every joke. It's funny because he would actually melt in Summit and he doesn't get that. This breaks the pace of the movie and it's such a point to song. Then there's Fix Whopper that speaks for itself. The music is not really that bad, but in context in the lyrics are really annoying. 
It's such a stretch in the movie, at least it's better than Gaiku from Punchback. There's no third act so not even a reprise. Speaking of, I saved the apple the first time I've ever reprised. I echo this soundtrack feels connected, ignoring those two comedic songs. This is a nice reprise and all. But the music speed always felt off with this song, and this highlights my point with the dynamic. All the interactions feel the same, I wish there was a song to show conflict between them. Oh wait, there was in Yikes Too Short, the yeeted scene. This song goes too hard only for it to have been cut from the movie. Not only does it sound great, it introduces the conflict by Anna trying to ask Elsa to put the girls back on. It shows both their character flaws, but Elsa being shut out and Anna too naive and condescending, with both being the bait to be selfish. Having this, followed by a replay later of both of them regretting their past actions, would have been great. Probably too late for this movie with Jarrell's cut. Moving on, the soundtrack is very hit or miss, has elements of a great musical and if you skip some songs it is, but it has some fear songs and it's placed in a weird way to make you feel like too many songs. The Deeps throws into her better songs, which here counts like Elsa, Olaf and Kristoff good songs, and gave the rock trolls no song. Part 5, a Disney subversion. This movie in part subverts Disney and traditional fairy tale stories in general. I don't have a problem with that. I think the purity of classical stories is too much and there's problems with them. From a story point of view, adding to and subverting elements of all the existing stories is interesting. A yet comes to a villain, Elsa is misunderstood and ends up being the one to save Anna instead of Hansel Kristoff. Making the solution to the story be obsidian Europe instead of fairy tale romance is great. However, this dynamic wasn't set up well as it should have been. They only interact once after Elsa went away for Anna's moment and nothing's really gained from that scene. Also, while Elsa's character seems inherently relatable, there isn't much time for this arc where to find the norm. Yet animated movies can go harder and experience on defying reputations and the system. But this tries to make Elsa's conflict most internal, not about the society that pushed away or hid her powers. I don't think the wire powers are seen as dangerous and we need to subvert that, but we feel mighty stronger. This movie feels like Cliff has a very emotional weight to it, given a rewrite that highlights these themes. Also, this subverse moment should have been kept to metal you have a reading. The dialogue has to try and make Disney jokes about Disney. Elsa and Kristoff say you can't marry a man you just met. It's funny because that's how most Diddy Princess films are. And that's why a reasonable person must respond to it. Disney must have thought they were so killed by putting those giants in and with the whole hands twist. While on the topic of comedy, I will say that most non olaf giants weren't funny. This takes the awkward dialogue that was one of the worst things in Tangled and doubles it. Back to subversion, it acts like it's being so boring instead of half based subverting a typical story. You could argue it's not that new, but stories where I say a character becoming a hero is common. You could go back and say Beauty and the Beast was subverted because the Beast being a good guy and Brass on a villain, and very right to read, I guess. You could go back far enough just having a female character do anything her voice was subversive. This movie won't be as subversive forever, which is most just a natural thing to happen in the media. But with all these ideas being normal, what is yet behind? A convoluted jumbo ideas that could have been great but poorly paced and a waste of most of what it does. Part 5 Conclusion Frozen's Legacy The Frozen phenomenon is interesting to think about how quick has come and stayed a cultural icon. Especially when it's on the movie itself and not just specific characters like the minions. This movie was popular, Rigi being the highest voted animated movie, which is strange for a film that isn't a sequel or a spin off. Its mass popularity lasted more than a year, I don't think it's properly ended. This used to Disney milking it for merch, toys, specials, and musical and sequels. Frozen 2 v 68, I think it's pretty good. It's an improvement, in my opinion, with Yotta Yike, but once again, it's wasted potential. Partially due to the fact the movie was rushed to release on time. This franchise may be cursed in that direction. I want to have hope for Frozen 3 to improve upon the good parts and see more of these characters in the world I like. However, it also has an equal chance to be a normal mixed bag. Also, as I was writing this, there was reports that there might be a Frozen 4. I can't wait for Frozen 10. Anyway, Frozen has become both overrated and overhated by its popularity. I hated it before it was even popular, and now I think it's average. The good stuff is really good, but I think it's the weak side of all the studios post chicken yittle films. Well, Fixed and says pushing it, but in the end I'll probably end up picking that film. This video is young enough now. If you enjoyed this video, consider pressing subscribe and watching more. For a film I mixed on, I thought about and watched Frozen so much that this video is a finalization of that. I also hope Wish is good, I'll probably discuss that next video. The end.